Welcome to Fragmented, a software developer podcast where we talk about building good software and becoming better developers. My name's Don Felker. And I'm Kaushik Gopal. Welcome to the show. Before we get going here, I wanted to share with you something that you might find very useful and helpful. Very recently, I wrote an ebook on how to make sure that you're billing at a high enough rate if you're a freelancer or consultant. So if you do any type of freelancing or consulting, then please pay attention. Very often when folks start consulting or freelancing, they set their rates too low, mainly because they don't know what the rate should be, or they just feel like that's the best way to get clients. And in fact, you will get clients. However, unfortunately, over a period of time, you'll find out that you just cannot sustain at that low consulting or freelancing rate. So I've written a book, small ebook that you can download for free that will show you the very bare minimum amount that you need to be charging as a freelancer or consultant so that you can make the right amount of money. So if you decide to go full-time in consulting or full-time in freelancing, or just continue to do it when you have time, this will ensure that you're charging the right amount. And you can get that ebook at donfelker.com slash ebook. Just plug in your email. I'll send you the PDF right to right to you. Uh, it's free of charge. So nothing on my end. Just plug in your email. And uh, again, that's at donfelker.com slash ebook. Hey, everybody. Today, we're going to talk about why I feel everybody should learn some type of technology that is really heavily rooted in the unidirectional data flow pattern. And I'm going to re- recommend that you learn something like React. And if you still can't stomach the thought of learning something in React, maybe you're not a web developer, you don't have that experience, then I recommend that you learn something like Flutter, which has a very similar concept um, to React. One of the things you'll notice when you're working with Flutter, if you go down that route, and if you do have experience with React is, it feels very much like React. And what the thing that you're feeling that is similar from Flutter to React and so forth is the unidirectional data flow pattern. And so today's short episode is going to talk a little bit about that, which is the unidirectional data flow pattern and why you should be implementing that inside of perhaps some of your apps or just experience it uh, with something like React or Flutter. So let's just stick with the React concept because that was my first real, I've worked with unidirectional data flow before, but when I finally got to develop a React app, probably about three years ago, it's where everything really clicked for me. I thought, I thought, oh, this is how it should be done. Everything else that I'd worked with inside of Android was kind of this hodgepodge. Everything's kind of bolted together. There wasn't any really cohesive way of implementing it. And though you can do it, it would never felt like it was supposed to be that way. I always felt like things were just kind of patched together and it was very easy to miss a step or just fall back into old bad patterns or habits. When you work with React, React works a very certain way. And essentially what happens is, let's just take it from, again, if you're not familiar with React, let's cover that for a second. React is a web UI framework. It's for creating basically single page applications and you have state, you have views, and you have actions that you can perform and so forth. And the, the general synopsis is that state is passed into a view and into child components. Inside of React, you have components. These are basically things that are shown on the screen. It could be a, a list item. It could be part of a screen. Uh, it could be the whole screen. They're all just components. In Android, we'd call those views. And so state is passed to each of these views. And then state from there can also be passed to child components. So components can have ch- children components. And then certain actions are triggered by the view. This could be typing in some text, that could be clicking a button, anything like that. And then these actions can then update that state. Now, what happens is behind the scenes, React is watching for any of these state changes and will re-render the page and redraw everything out in real time. So there's kind of like this reactive flow to it, which is why it's called React. The state then when it's changed is passed to the view then into its child component. So if we have, perhaps a some state that's showing a name and it is displaying in a couple of children components and the the parent component has a input box with a button and you type into this input 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 box the name or you change a name those change events inside of that input box could then 
update the state, and th- which then at that time React could then update all the child components as well because it's watching in real time. And you really don't have to do anything. You don't have to tell React to do this. It just does it. As long as you're passing the state down and using the props and everything as React has been designed and you're not fighting the system, all of this will just happen automatically. You don't have to wire anything up. You don't have to subscribe. You don't have to do anything of that nature whatsoever. If you click a button, you can then, maybe if you decide to click a button, it turns the text to uppercase. You could do that. Again, what's happening here is the state is passed to the view, which if you have child components, it's just showing the first name. You're then changing the text. That's an action that's being triggered by the view. When that action occurs, which is a change event, it's updating the state. You're updating the name variable or whatever, the name state variable. And at that point, React sees that the state has been changed and it's going to update the view and all of its child components that have access or are using that data. And so again, we're going from, we have the state, which is shown in the view, and the view has actions and the actions can update the state, which then in turn updates the view. It's kind of a nice circular process here. And it's unidirectional, meaning it's one way. We're always going to go one way. And if you think about it, the, the view is really the result of the application state. And state can only change when actions happen. And then when actions happen, the state is updated. Now there's some benefits with this. This is known as a one-way binding. It's not a two-way binding. And this has some really high-end, well not high-end, just some really key advantages that you can lean on here. And, and one of them is going to be that it's less error prone. You have basically more control over your data because it's easier to debug. Um, you really you really know where your data is coming from and where. When something's being updated, it's being passed down. Inside of a React component, very often you'll have some props and these are basically values that are passed into your component. Let's say you receive a name variable in through the constructor props, which is basically the constructor of that component. If that changes, uh, React will know that that changes. Perhaps it was changed from the parent. React will kind of walk down the entire object graph and know what state has been changed and where it's come from. So if you're actually working inside of a component and you're wondering, well, why is this thing updating or not updating? You can then go find it inside of your component. Is it coming from your props or is it not coming from your props? As long as you understand that data is always flowing down from the top, it's much easier to understand. Now, it's also much more efficient because the React library knows the boundaries of each part of the system. It knows that it's always pushing that data down. So overall, you know that where the data is coming from and if some type of state change is happening, it's updating the state, which then is just flowing through the system. And one thing to note here too, is when you have a unidirectional data flow pattern, it's important to note that changing a state on like a React component will never really affect its parent unless you have some type of callback mechanism that's kind of built in uh, through and through an action. But if we just leave that out of it, Anytime state changes in in a component, it won't affect its parent or its direct siblings inside of the hierarchy of the of the DOM or any other component of the application. It'll just affect its children. Now, if you do want it to affect some type of higher level, then you need some type of state management technique that could be something like Redux. It could be something like a reducer somewhere, uh, or you could have some type of callbacks. Um, there's a bunch of different options. However, what you'll see is that there's different ways to accomplish this. Now you do have to be careful with that. There have been multiple, you see multiple blog posts about humongous Redux applications where it's just a complete mess to manage and basically it's a huge state machine. So you have to be really careful of what state is going where. I've built applications where I don't have any state that's managed by the application at the higher level and components are just rendering data that they need inside of their own components. Now, what, one of the things you might be thinking is, well, what if I need to get data from an API? Well, that's fine. A component can make HTTP calls and it goes out and gets data and then it renders the data on the screen and that component may have child components and it pushes its data down into those child components and it updates. The same thing could also happen when an action occurs, maybe in a child component. You say, hey, this button was clicked and you just provide a callback and then the parent can say, hey, when this child's button is clicked, call this parent action and you basically pass this in through a pass the function in through the constructor so passing in a function that gets reinvoked and maybe that function just calls back out to the database to or to the api to refresh the data again the data is refreshed in the parent and shoved back down to the children so overall the real key thing here that you're going to learn when you're learning react is how 
the unidirectional data flow pattern works. And because React is built a certain way, it only works that way, really. If you try to fight against it or you want to try to inject different types of things, you're going to get some real messy spaghetti code. But if you kind of follow the patterns and the configuration of how it's React is set up, it's actually very elegant and you will learn a lot about how unidirectional data flow works and actually about how all of how powerful React is. Now I did mention earlier on that Flutter is a valuable tool to also learn this and I still believe that. In my opinion, and I haven't interviewed anyone over on the Flutter team, but it is quite obvious that Flutter is highly, highly influenced by React. Now, the same thing can also be said of something like Jetpack Compose or Swift UI. Both have this style of unidirectional data flow. Uh, and the reason why is just because it works. It's actually a, a kind of a joy to work with, and you're not having spaghetti code all over the place and event buses and all kinds of stuff. Now, again, that doesn't mean that it's protecting you from writing bad code. You can always do that, but it does show you the act, gives you a nice system that's just built in to the platform in which you can update state to update the view and then perform actions to update that state. And it just kind of goes in a circular pattern. And what I'm going to do inside of the show notes here is I'm going to include an image in the show notes. So be sure to check that out and you'll see a nice little kind of a circular diagram that shows the view, the actions, the state, and I'll put some notes inside of the show notes so you can view it. I'll also provide a couple of links for you if you're interested in learning React or how you can get started. Uh, there's a couple of places out there that you can learn React pretty easily and the documentation's pretty good. And the same thing for Flutter. You're gonna learn on both ends what and how unidirectional data flow works. Now, if you do go with React, there's a couple different ways to do it. You're going to have hooks. You're going to have, you know, function components, stuff like that. You can use whichever one really makes sense to you. I choose to use hooks just because it makes sense and it's a lot less code. If you're using Flutter, you'll use basically the set state all over the place. And now again, once you kind of get into each one of these platforms, you're going to see patterns inside of there that you haven't seen inside of other technologies. That's okay. It doesn't mean you have to go into it doesn't mean you have to become an expert. All you're really doing here is learning about how the unidirectional data flow pattern works simply because it helps you be less error prone and have more control over your data. It's easier to debug because you know exactly where that data is coming from. And overall, it just makes you much more efficient, in my opinion, as a developer. You're going to see this pattern and it just makes sense. And we're like, wow, how did I live without this before? Which, again, is one of my opinions of why things like Jetpack Compose, Swift UI are going to be very popular once they get to a stable state. These things have massive, massive opportunities to make the developer experience for both platforms a lot better. And if you do decide to go to web, you can just kind of hop over to something like React uh, or one of the other libraries that are similar to it. Now, I hope that helps. Again, check the show notes for the diagram and the links so you can understand how and what you need to do to experiment with one of these things. And what I recommend that you do is just build a simple to-do based application. I know it sounds simple, but when you have to-dos in there, there's a bunch of things you have to deal with. How are you going to persist state? How are you going to update state? How are you going to store that state? Are you going to communicate with an API? Are you going to use something custom like your own database? Are you going to use Firebase? The options are really endless at that point in time. But what it will really do, even if you just store the state locally on the client, it's going to give you a bunch of opportunities to learn how everything works, which then is going to grow you as a developer. Now, I hope that helps and I'll catch you all next time. Hey folks, before you get going, don't forget you can download the free ebook that'll show you how and why you need to charge at a high enough rate. That's going to be at donfelker.com slash ebook. Just go there, plug in your email. I'll give you the PDF for free. And I'll show you everything you need to know on how to charge the proper bare minimum rate and also what I recommend. See you over there. That's it for the show, folks. Fragmented is hosted by Don Felker and me, Kaushik Gopal. We edit and produce all the episodes here on Fragmented. You can find more fragmented episodes at fragmentedpodcast.com. Thanks for listening, and we will catch you in the next episode.